Tinakoto, Tinakoto Katoa. The warmest greetings to each and every one of you. Kor Philip and you love Aho. Mori Aho. Mori Tu. Mori Ora Kia Tato. Haumi Mai Hui A Taiki A. Life force awaken and stand tall. Life force, all wellness, good health for everyone present. Let us join together and unite. We are ready to progress the purpose of coming together. Let us leave the preoccupations of our day at the door and be present for this most important discussion. Women in Super is proud to be a supporter and lead for this sixth stream of the Financial Services Council It Starts With Action campaign. And Westpac is delighted to be a supporter and hosting today's event, the gender retirement gap and how to fix it. I would like to invite Richard Clippen, Chief Executive Officer of the Financial Services Council, to begin today's conversation. Welcome, Richard. Kia ora everybody. Uh, Philippa, thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you to Westpac for hosting a fantastic uh, event today. Um, if you had have asked anyone in the FSC, um, Jane, six months ago, how will ISWA, It Starts With Action, be going, we probably would have, got, would have gone, look, it's a, you know, it's a test and learn, it's a project, we'll see how we go. Um, and oh my God, um, the last four or five months has just been this kind of roller coaster ride, but the momentum for change, the support around the sector, the support outside of the sector has just been fantastic. What, what I think we've kind of landed on is a way to take a topic that's dear to everyone's hearts, uh, build a coalition, build a pan sector coalition, and really start to drive a, a, a bunch of uh, discussion and messages and so on. You know, I, I, I look around the room and I see so many people who have been so instrumental in leading and guiding and driving this. And if I think uh, to Tracy, who, uh, who, who not 12 months ago sat in front of the board along with uh, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the FSC and said, let's get, this, let's get the show started, but let's make sure there's an action focus. Let's make sure that we're doing something about it. And I think as I stand here today, uh, within a few weeks of the end of the official uh, campaign, I can see there are so many green shoots and opportunities for change, so many conversations that we've had in so many different places, led by people, and this is a leadership issue for everyone, but led by people who have stepped into the conversation, who've got involved, who've done it in big, big places and small, inside their businesses and to their clients, kind of right across the conversation, uh, all of those things are uh, meaning that there's a, uh, this kind of growing national discussion. And I think the ISWA campaign, much uh, less being a start and finish, actually is a beginning. And I think uh, today's discussion is really important in that regard because the conversation is, if there's so much um, um, a, a momentum for change, what is it that we want to change? And who do we have to influence to change? And where's this going to take us? And let us use this campaign as the beginning rather than the end. And I think that's kind of the learning, even though we're, we're still uh, you know, not, not yet at the completion of the ISWA campaign. So I want to, I want to just pay tribute to, to a few people. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, I was reflecting, you know, um, this is only the second real event, like face-to-face, in-person show we've run really for quite some time. So um, thank you and for staying safe and thank you for coming out uh, today. Um, I did want to uh, thank Women in Super. This has been, you know, when we started the journey, this was a highly collaborative affair. We didn't know how big or small it would be, but a lot of people put a lot of risk on the table and said, yeah, we're happy to commit. So thank you to, the, to Women in super. Thank you uh, also to the Retirement Commissioner and to the Retirement Commission because when Jane and uh, Tracy and I had a quiet coffee up uh, somewhere near Sky City last year, I think it was, with, a, hey, would, ha how would the FSC think about being involved in this Building Financial Capability for Women campaign? Um, you know, we had a few reservations. I, to be honest, it was a question of, um, is this important to us or is it important to the Retirement Commission? 
but it became really clear really quickly, actually it's important to all of us. Um, and very quickly, uh, through the DNI committee, through Tracy and Christie's leadership, um, we said, yeah, we're absolutely all in. And all in has meant that for the last 12 months, and in particular for the last four or five months, it's just been such a huge amount of activity and work. So, so I, I think we're making a difference. I think change is in the air. And I think ultimately it all starts with us. So a, a quick thank you to the steering group in the Diversity and Inclusion Committee and the ISWA campaign, to the working group who have made this all happen, to the 95-odd supporters and supporting organisations have also made this happen uh, and obviously we'll bring this all together at the ISWA Summit at the Park Hyatt uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So with that, um, a huge thank you. Um, it's ultimately going to be up to us. I think that's really where it stands. If we want change, we can already see it in the air. It's about what we collectively and individually will do. And so with that, uh, I commend the session today. Huge amount of work to, uh, to get us to this point um, and really looking forward to the discussion, the constructive outcomes and ultimately the action that we can take. So thank you, Philip. Thank you, Richard. So we're here today to discuss the gender retirement gap. I think it's certain that each and every one of us in this room who has looked back at historical cases of great inequity and wondered how they could have persisted. In these situations, we find ourselves asking, why did people think that was okay? Why did people put up with that? And why didn't somebody do something sooner to address that? This afternoon, we're here to scrutinise just such an issue. As a result of the different way women relate to money when compared to men, as a result of pay inequity, and as a result of paid working lives that are often interrupted with carer responsibilities, women arrive at retirement with less. This is the gender retirement gap. We're looking forward to hearing the views of our panellists on how to fix the gender retirement gap. But before I hand over to them, let's examine just what this gap looks like and some of the factors that underpin it. As a starting point, New Zealand's state pension, New Zealand superannuation, is individual, universal, and non-contributory. Thus, it's blind to gender. However, research published by the Massey Finn Ed Centre shows that the average retired household continues to spend in excess of New Zealand superannuation. This tells us that New Zealand super alone is not going to provide a comfortable or even an adequate retirement. And it highlights the importance of making financial provision for retirement over and above national super. In this context, we turn our attention to KiwiSaver to determine how well it meets the shortfall. KiwiSaver provides benefits which are directly related to member, employer and annual government contributions. And while it's possible for the self-employed and the unemployed to make voluntary contributions, there is little structured system, system, there's little structured system to support this. As such, KiwiSaver has an inherent bias towards employees. And more particularly, its design delivers a highly gendered outcome as it is oriented to a male biased work model of continuous full-time employment. According to March 2022 Melville Jessup Weaver KiwiSaver demographic study, there are more female KiwiSaver members at 51.3% than male at 48.7%. These numbers indicate that women are committed to saving for their retirement. However, currently, the average KiwiSaver balance for a male is 20% higher than that of a female. And for those in the 61 to 65 year age group, that gap increases to an astounding 27%. These figures are the startling exemplars of the gender retirement gap. And this smaller accumulation by women is at odds with the fact that on average women live longer than men. Research indicates that the single largest contributing factor 
to the gender retirement savings gap is the total amount of earnings over a person's working life. And while 2022 marks 50 years since the Equal Pay Act came into effect, according to Statistics New Zealand, women are currently paid around 9.1% less than men. Given contributions to KiwiSaver are based on earnings, the gender pay gap inevitably underpins the gender retirement gap. There are, however, other significant impacts on women's earning potential and contributions to their retirement savings at play. These include the fact that women have more and significantly longer periods where they're out of the workforce, taking on lead carer roles for our children and our ageing whānau. To support these roles, women have a higher propensity to work part-time and comprise nearly 72% of New Zealand's part-time workforce. Women's part-time work and time out of the workforce can negatively impact on promotion opportunities and hence lifetime earnings. And female-dominated industries such as care services and teaching have lower average wages compared to male-dominated industries such as finance and engineering. In summary, in the context of retirement savings, women are absorbed into a male model of workplace, workplace participation, yet their paid working lives tend to be very different. How do we see this manifest in the context of KiwiSaver? Over one in five women have a KiwiSaver account but don't contribute to it. It's 22% compared with 16% of men. Of those who are contributing, women are more likely to contribute the minimum of 3%, while significantly higher proportions of men contribute at higher levels. 25% of men contribute 6 to 8%. Women are less likely to participate in funds that yield a high return. Data published by the Financial Markets Authority in 2020 showed that women were more likely than men to take a conservative funds approach. And conversely, men were overrepresented in growth funds. On average, women score higher than men in short-term money management, and they're more likely to plan their budgets exactly. As such, they are not the money wastrels they are so often portrayed to be. However, they relate to money differently, and accordingly there's a gender gap in terms of confidence and using financial products. For instance, checking if a financial product meets their needs. Communication from KiwiSaver scheme providers often ignores needs that are specific to women and uses language that doesn't appeal to women. As such, women are continuing to miss opportunities to build on assets and savings that could contribute to closing the gender retirement savings gap. And this is even more the case for Wahini Māori and Pacifica women. It is nearly time to hear from our panel, but just before we do, let's listen to some first-hand observations from women around retirement planning. tend to take time off when the babies arrive um, and also women tend to earn less money than men which means we will have less disposable income available that can be saved up for retirement and also women tend to live longer than men um, which means we'll need more retirement funding future. You don't get a pay rise the year that you are on maternity leave and then when you come back because you haven't been there for a year you don't get a pay rise again so I found that there were two years in a row 
where you miss out on a pay rise, even though you may have only been out of the workforce for a year. You're constantly putting your family ahead of things. You, you're, upon, uh, you're putting, you know, managing the household ahead of everything else. And by the time you're done with all that, you're exhausted. And mentally, you just don't have the capacity to think about anything outside of you know, household management and let alone having to learn about investments and things like that and you really need to dedicate time for that. You pick up magazines, you pick up brochures, you look at advertisements, what are you going to see? Likelihood is men you know, making investment decisions and stuff like that. So it does create those biases in your head. It reinforces those beliefs that it is a man's world and it's a man's job, therefore, and they're better at it. Personally, I'm very financial, financially independent and I love it that way, you know, that I'm not dependent on anyone else, whatever I want to do, wherever I want to go. So it does worry me that I haven't saved much towards retirement at this stage because then I'm thinking, would I be <laughs> dependent, you know? And the thought of being dependent on my kids doesn't feel good. Excellent. I'd like to introduce Tracy Cross, our facilitator for today's panel discussion. Tracy is Chair of Women in Super and a legal and business advisor. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you, Philippa. Uh, Tena Koto Couture, thank you for joining us today to brainstorm some really pragmatic solutions to close that uh, gender retirement gap. Um, I certainly wasn't intending to MC this when I got out of bed this morning, but there you go, no, no day is a dull day. Um, I appreciate um, I'm in an, a room with an army of allies. We're all here um, because we truly believe that change is required and uh, now is the time for that change. Um, and I'm joined by a very esteemed panel of speakers. With 114,000 more women um, than men in our terror, we are not a niche, we are a majority. And when, a major with, with, when many of that majority are retiring um, into po in poverty, that's a serious problem. You know, we need to do something about it. The National Strategy for Financial Capability has women as one of three target audiences. And it warms my heart that we are here today putting a spotlight on this topic. You know, we have a lot of work to do um, and we need to start now, as Richard said. I'd like to welcome um, our esteemed panellists onto the stage to join me. Uh, Jane Wrightson, Retirement Commissioner. Tiara Ahanga, Aura Retirement Commission. Thank you, Jane. David Boyle, Head of Sales and Marketing, Mint Asset Management. And Michelle Cause scott Head of Risk and Compliance and General Counsel, Milford Asset Management. And then, of course, you have me, because I was going to be a bit of a panellist, so I've got sort of two hats. So thank you very much for joining us. Change takes time and requires action across many areas, and it, change, it, it requires commitment and real leadership to actually um, make that change. And it can't fall upon women to do everything ourselves. This is a collaborative conversation, and I really do applaud the men and their leadership in joining us today. Thank you. Um, I think that's a separate conversation as to how and why we don't get more men in the conversation, but we will move forward with that. Um, we need to work together. This is the time to collaborate to make the change. Um, today I'll be inviting our panellists to share their thoughts on what action they think is required to eliminate the gender gap in retirement. So we're going to focus on four areas. <clears throat> Systemic change, the change that industry can take, individuals can take, and then of course government. Now, this isn't a conversation where we want to throw everything at government's door. Come on, you haven't done this. We appreciate that wheels move slowly in government. Certainly change is required there. But this is about stepping up and actually identifying what we can all do, be it as individuals, within our organisations um, and more widely in our communities. I think that's a really um, important aspect of it. And as Richard mentioned, you know, we will be focusing and discussing on who is going to lead that change and take that action um, and the ways in which everyone can participate. 
how do we really, you know, the FSC campaign was a call to action and we've got great momentum, you know, going in that respect. How do we really harness it and take that forward to get our impactful change? Because this isn't a talk fest. I think we've done enough talking. Women in Super, we reflected at our anniversary event last year. 20 years we've been going, doing some great stuff around financial awareness and schools and what have you. But what has changed? Nothing. Uh, now is the time for change. So I really do appreciate you being here and um, moving forward on this journey with us. So I'm going to put to the, the, the panel and give them their time to shine in respect of um, you know, the, the, sort of the, the answers that they see and then we'll sort of come into a conversation and then we'll put it out to you for a bit of a Q&A. The idea is that we are really sort of accumulating pragmatic solutions that we can take forward and there will be action following this, seriously. Um, you will all be um, um, prodded to get into action within your organisations to champion this conversation as we move towards change. But look, let's get started, enough from me. Um, Jane, let's start with you. Set the scene for us. Um, what are the most critical changes that you believe we must um, make to face the future effectively? Ngā mihi mahana o te wā ki tātou, a ki mana whenua, tēnā koutou, ki ngā manuhiri, no mai haere mai, Ko au te mana Ahangarua, I'm the Retirement Commissioner, uh, called Jane Wrights in Toko Ingoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. And it's serious privilege of us to be here, thank you very much. Uh, with grateful thanks uh, to the FSC, the FSC Board, Richard, Tracy and Women in Super, and the incredible Clarissa who has run the It Starts With Action project on behalf of us all. Um, it Starts With Action is the first Shifting the Dial project for the National Strategy for Financial Capability, which I'm just going to leave up there for you to, to mull over, because it occurs to me that there'll be a whole bunch of people in this room that have never heard of such a thing. Uh, and it's important that you understand that there is one, that there has been one that has been created, um, co-designed with a, a, a number of people across the sector, and it's a way for you to think about um, how your FinCap activities may fit into a broader framework, a broader sector framework, and a way for you to think about where the gaps are, and, and it might be a way for you to articulate um, uh, how you, you'll put your ideas into your own organisation and get them resourced. Um, <clears throat> It starts with action as the first shifting the dial project that, that's come out of the strat. Um, women are one of the three primary audiences, uh, women, Māori, Pacifica, and of course women are included in the other two as well, so we get a triple hit on that one. Um, and the reason they were the primary audiences is not because any of those um, cohorts are stupid. Um, they have different needs, all report they're not being well served by information and services from the sector. Um, they. Um, and there's so much research on this that um, you have to think that now we understand the problem, we have to start thinking about what to do about it. Um, the goals of the NAT strat are demystify money, consistent content, work together. You know, we kept it really high level, nice and simple. This is a work together project. And the NAT strat can only work if there's active sector engagement. Um, it starts with action as a brilliant example. Um, and I'm so grateful for all of you that have contributed to it. It was a pretty ropey idea at the beginning. And yes, there was a famous breakfast where Richard um, was strong-armed into accepting the challenge. Um, and I'd like to think that you know this wouldn't have happened without the strategy giving it a push. Um, of course, acknowledging that we're standing on the shoulders of the women who have worked on in areas like this for many years over the sector. And it exists so that we can get a better understanding of what's happening across the sector, so we can jointly tackle problems, intractable, big, hairy, gnarly problems like this one. Um, and, and even more importantly, so we don't duplicate effort, because that's just wasting resource, and it, and it gets fragmented, and we don't see change. So the gender retirement gap is real. Um, the data is clear, and the reasons are obvious. Um, even one of the reasons I personally thought might be a contributor to this, um, women's alleged dislike of taking risk and thus losing higher returns, has just been debunked by the Society of Actuaries. So, I, you know, I failed my own test on this one even. The reason the gender retirement gap is so pronounced, we've heard it. Um, we earn less over our working lifetimes. We spend more time out of the workforce. 
we bounce back less successfully after financial life shocks like divorce, and we live longer. The solutions are not simple. And the point of this panel is to talk about actions we can t all take or champion. I would note that there's a lot of work that's already done uh, in financial education and financial literacy, right? And yet it seems not to lead to significant change in these, in, in these areas. Uh, in my view, the answer is less likely to be more education. That's the easy one you throw out. Let's educate people some more. Um, there's plenty of that out there for those who wish to find it, and nudging people to find it is the hard bit. But, it's, but if you just keep adding to that without thinking more deeply, it's just adding to the fragmentation. Um, the answer is more likely to be smarter, collective ways to nudge long-term behaviour change. And one organisation, um, or even a small number of diverse ones, will not be able to manage that. This is why it's a gnarly problem, and this is why a sector response could be really interesting here. What if we all said the same thing over the same period of time in all our different platforms for a period? What if we said that, if we identified the three areas we wanted to nudge? That would be quite powerful, wouldn't it? Um, the trick will be identifying targeted, measurable and incremental change. This is not a big bang um, um, project, I think, um, because it's too hard. And if you start thinking about big bangs, you spend the next five years figuring out that you can't, you can't bang it enough, bigly enough and it doesn't work and then you go, right, well, that was a waste of time, wasn't it? <laughs> Incremental change is the trick, I think. And as a provocation, I, for one, am not really interested in tossing out ideas for mysterious others to execute, right? It's a cop-out. I'm interested in what the people in this room could implement now if they were so inclined, separately or together, and that's the whole point of it starts with action. Um, on the systemic and government change front, what could government do? Well, if you think about MB, the KiwiSaver reviews got a bit waylaid. Um, there's a tiny little team inside MB looking after that who have got diverted into supermarkets and other such difficult things. So um, there's still opportunity to have a decent input into a, into a re review that's not yet structured. Um, what changes to KiwiSaver does the sector believe would most help women? Um, a small number, don't do lots of them because it just confuses officials and they will decide it's too hard and don't do any work. A small number of key changes with some uh, metrics behind them could be advocated for right now. And what are the best ones to benefit women? You people in this room have considerably more expertise than me on this and I think this is worth a, a good conversation today. Um, we talk about care credits occasionally as one of those options. And the thing about care credits is that we need to understand what we're talking about. Um, are we talk in effect, I think we're talking about maintaining employer contribution, Kiwi Saver contributions during parental leave. I think that's what we mean. There are other ideas for it, but I think that's the nub. <clears throat> also acknowledging, like Kiwi Saver, this only benefits a certain type of woman, right? It's, a, it's for privileged women with a small p. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad idea. But assuming the concept of employer contrib uh, paying employer contributions during parental leave uh, is a good idea, and assuming there's broad agreement about that, the question is, of course, who pays? The government? Large employers? Government's already paying parental leave covering, so you remember that. Um, why can't large employers just do it? especially in this sector, as, as a leadership thing, and why couldn't you crow about it to say, we do this for our people, it can be done. Um, I've just introduced it at the Retirement Commission, tr trying to put you know, our money where our mouth is, as it were, paying the employer contribution doing parental leave. Why couldn't it be a sector initiative? Or a big six? Or some of the, uh, the organisations going, yeah, we could do that. And then talking about it to, to show leadership and, and a bit of inspiration to other employers. Won't work for small employers, won't work for different, for, for, for ty you know, there are areas where it simply won't work, but that's not a reason to try and think about where it might work. Um, increase the Kiwi save, minimum Kiwi Saver contribution. Worth a talk. David, I'm sure, will talk about that. I've got a little slogan in my head that says 5% <laughs> by 2025. Why not? Um, the, government, <laughs> the government could regulate by now pay later. Um, it's been talked about. I don't know how deeply and intensely, because regulation is hard, as you know. Um, but if the sector thought that was a good idea, it would be a good advocacy point, because levels of bad debt are clearly rising. 
connected to the schemes. Um, the FMA could get providers to release more detailed aggregated gender data every year so we can really understand the trends around women KiwiSaver customers and investors. If we know those trends better, we can design better uh, targeted products, services and messaging. Um, the, the, the Merrill Jessup Weaver uh, paper that was cited by Philippa, I think, earlier, we commissioned as part of this year's Review of Retirement Income Policies. Um, and I said to my policy person, oh, yeah, we know all that, really. And she said, we don't. That data has never been published before like this. And I went, well, this is so stupid. The, the, the transparency of data becomes really interesting. And if you aggregate it, there's nothing to stop it. And Chia Ahaga Ora itself, the Retirement Commission, or the F Commission for Financial Capabilities, we used to be called. You know, could we work on a on a joint in, on some kind of joint industry marketing, combining sorted and your own marketing efforts to reinforce some clever nudging, which would really maximise reach, wouldn't it? We'd have to agree on the message. We'd have to agree how to do it. It would take a fair bit of whiteboarding, um, all that stuff. But again, not impossible. Um, so the challenge is, um, what do you want government to do? Make it easy, make it doable, and make it a collective piece of advocacy that's always powerful. And then what can industry itself do? Because that's the first thing government will ask. What are you doing about it? Don't just sh shout at us. You've got much more power than we've got in this space, and it's true. Mm. And the last thing I would say, a wee note on NZ Super, um, defend it with your life and think really hard when opposition parties, and every opposition party runs this when they're in opposition, and usually it goes away when they're in government, but when we start talking blithely about putting the age up, um, and we only talk about, you know, crunching the numbers and the country can't afford it and all these terribly, terribly important, difficult things, first question is, who says we can't afford it? B, uh, second question is, what trade-offs are we making for that? And the last and crucial question, who's it going to hurt if we put the age up? Easy! It's going to hurt Māori, Pacifica and women because there's a retirement gender gap. So hold that thought when you start seeing those political discussions happening. Right, that's enough from me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very privileged to be here, thank you, and I look forward to moving past ideation to some concrete actions. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Jane. Well, clearly the challenge is there. A lot to be done, but I think that it's just so exciting. I think that, um, you know, some of the points... Progress has been made. You know, it's not a hard done by sort of story. There is so much to be done, and I think that's such a good story for, you know, for companies, for entities to, to pick this up. It's showing leadership. It's doing the right thing in this conduct and culture world. It's it's supporting your staff, your people, your clients. Good profile. Good for business. Why would you not do that? I sort of ask myself uh, constantly. But I think that what we've shown through this campaign is a real momentum. We can actually come together as an industry to do some things. Who would have thought? We've been operating in silos all of these years. We don't have to recreate the same tools, the same programs, etc. Let's come together and let's all champion this sort of concept within our organisations. But Michelle, coming to you. So it's always tempting to sort of load the burden of change on individuals. And we know that women, for one, are doing sort of 60% of the voluntary work um, in our society. And there's also that recent statistic that talks about um, a, a mother having sort of an, on average, 10 minutes of me time a day. How ridiculous is that? So, you know, how, how is she going to have time to do anything else? But what are the solutions that you see that will work for women on an individual level, bearing in mind that they're also likely to be um, working with small employers? Yeah, thanks, Tracy. I mean, it's, um, it's really tricky because there is no silver bullet, is there? And we've started to hear that from what Jane's saying. Um, so sort of complementing what Jane's talked about, I'm going to look more at just sort of at the grassroots and what can we all do ourselves to try and make a difference. And for me, um, I think we need to learn to talk about money and specifically our KiwiSaver retirement um, balances. I think that would promote greater awareness and then much better knowledge around what we're doing amongst women. And I'm not trying to underplay the issue um, that we're facing into. I'm more thinking if we speak about it often and openly, um, that people will get more comfortable with the topic um, and start understanding a few more of the levers that affect their KiwiSaver. Um, so 
my thinking is, okay, let's get people talking about it. Because if we can get people to start showing curiosity about it, then I think we'll find they're much more willing to take on the knowledge that will help them get a lot further ahead. You know, you think about it, money is often quite a taboo subject. So how do we start to break those barriers down? I think, um, picking up on what Jane said, we definitely need to speak frankly about the New Zealand um, super regime not going to be sufficient to provide people with a comfortable retirement going forward. Um, women are living longer, um, and there's a necessity for us each to understand what we can do to maximise our own KiwiSaver balances, whatever our circumstances. So how much money do I want in my retirement? How much money do I need in my retirement? Um, and where am I at the moment? And what are the tools that are going to be available to me as a woman to help me get my balance um, to where I need it to be, basically? Money. They say money makes the world go round. Um, and yet money, many of us find it difficult to talk about that. A good example of that is our pay. Fact one, we have a gender pay gap. And we know that that gender pay gap is a key driver for the retirement, um, gender retirement gap we're talking about today. I really feel that open and transparent conversations can help address this issue. So the sorts of conversations that we could start are encouraging our employers um, to report their gender pay gap, either in their annual report or on their website. I truly believe that if that gap is measured, it will narrow. In many respects, it's actually in the employer's own interest to do it, isn't it? Because open and transparent practices are what are attracting and retaining staff nowadays. Um, and retaining staff is really challenging in the current tight market. So um, all I can say is look at PwC in Australia and what they've done. They're now publishing their um, staff pay bans for all the world to see. And I think that leadership will actually promote some others to start doing the same. Because what that then does is it also allows you to talk to your family, your friends, maybe your peers about pay. Um, so discussing with others what we earn, or maybe a ballpark of what we earn, allows them and us to gauge whether we're being paid at a market rate um, and consistent with our male colleagues. And the first time you have that kind of conversation, it is a bit scary, and you probably start at a more um, you know, ballpark sort of level, but I think you'll find over time that that becomes easier. It's just as we get more used to talking about money. So for those of you who are in the room who are employers, I would really recommend and, or encourage you to remove those confidentiality provisions from your employment contracts, um, because I don't think those confidentiality clauses are serving women in their bid for pay equity. Um, and quite the opposite in a way, we need an open and transparent approach. And for you KiwiSaver providers out there, I challenge you to start publishing your own gender pay gap. Looking on the um, <laughs> Mind the Gap pay registry, at the moment there's only one non-bank KiwiSaver who's actually um, popping their data on there. And I think that's a really great leadership area for KiwiSaver providers to take forward. Perhaps even more important is talking about KiwiSaver itself, how much to save, the value of your contributions, and the importance of the KiwiSaver investment strategy you choose. By being open to conversations about KiwiSaver, it's possible for each of us to put ourselves into a much better position, to be better informed and to understand how to grow it. And you can then share that knowledge with your family and friends, and importantly, your children. It would be great if employers could take the opportunity when um, they've got new uh, female employees onboarding to their organisation to perhaps play them some sort of video clip. Ideally, it would be one produced by industry or sorted so that we know that the information is quality and is actually addressing some of the ish types of issues we're discussing today. So it's just a regular reminder for people of, you know, things we know, but just it's good sometimes to have a reminder of the different levers that are going to help maximise our own KiwiSaver savings. Fact two, we know that women take time out of the workforce to have children and to look after family members. And the lack of KiwiSaver contributions over that period has an impact on the retirement amount available to you. Which leads me to another conversation starter. 
instigating a conversation with your friends and colleagues who are about to go on maternity leave. Everyone's circumstances will be different, and we can be mindful of that, and yet still gently discuss whether it is possible for them to continue to contribute in some way. Perhaps a weekly sum from the family finances, perhaps your spouse or partner um, electing to contribute towards your KiwiSaver during that time as well. The intent is purely to raise awareness of the topic. It's not tell the person what to do. It's just to try and promote some options. So for those of you who are employers, perhaps we could include the conversation as part of the people process when someone is looking to go on maternity leave, just prompting the thought. Fact three, it's known, although I'm now not so sure, that um, women are more risk averse than men, uh, which means that they often choose a lower risk strategy than men. And I recently chatted with um, a woman in her mid-twenties who proudly told me she had her KiwiSaver invested in a conservative strategy. <coughs> a bit like the um, hare and tortoise fable, you know, safe and steady does it. But that is just so not true in this case. Um, and so, you know, we really need to talk about this. We need, um, because people over a longer period of time you know, they're going to, if they have a higher risk strategy to deliver a higher KiwiSaver balance, then albeit there's going to be some big ups and downs along the way, they're usually going to get to a much better balance at the end of the day. So we really need to talk about this. We need to talk about people holding the course. We also need to talk about risk tolerance and when it is okay and when you should be actually looking at a lower risk strategy. But this all often feels like such a complex foreign language so we really need to get rid of the jargon, and we can all be doing that. And so for KiwiSaver providers, I think we really need to focus on tailoring the message for women in a form that engages them and that resonates with them. And we have seen some KiwiSaver providers starting to advertise, you know, in MindFood, on Instagram, and it's messaging that's really tailored towards women. And I think if we can build these consistent measures over time, it'll definitely build more familiarity with the subject and therefore more confidence when you're dealing with your KiwiSaver. And I think for KiwiSaver providers themselves, um, you know, we really need to be more aware of this natural risk aversion and how to take steps to actively address it. So, for example, looking at our digital advice tools and looking with a lens that's mindful of that risk aversion and whether there's things we can build in there to help women um, address that as they're going through the tool. Looking at our website information, also with that lens. Ensuring that you've got female financial advisors that women are going to feel comfortable speaking with. So as an industry, I think the other thing we really need to focus on is providing some consistent information. And, um, you know, that kind of leads me into fact number four, because disinformation is rife. And it's important for the industry to provide consistent information to try and address that. I think it's equally important for there to be some sort of impartial source of truth out there that can be easily accessed. And the sorted.org.new um, Zealand is a great brand. And I wonder whether there's some scope to you know, evolve it to the next iteration to meet the needs of our younger generation and to also talk about some of these issues we're doing today in an, inter in an interactive sort of format. So, you know, I implore you, start the conversation. Talk to your partner, talk to your family members, friends, a fi trusted financial advisor. It needs to be someone you trust. But talking about your retirement and sharing what your goals are can really make it more likely you'll achieve them. And so I think it also enables you to get valuable insights and guidance. And I really commend the FSC because those money um, starter conversations that they've put out are absolutely excellent. So I sort of really encourage you, you know, take them along to your book club, take them to your baby coffee group, you know, share them with your children, but start the conversation and enjoy starting the conversation. Thanks, Michelle.
I think just on those, for anyone who hasn't seen the conversation starter cards available on the um, FSC website, Tereo version, family edition version, really easy and fun to start the conversation. I mean, I think we're only partially through the conversation. You can see how many things that we can actually do. Um, and so what we'll be doing over sort of the time following the session is really sort of testing some of these solutions in respect of what we're sort of going to take forward. Um, but with me, with my panellist hat on, I was really going to sort of touch briefly on product and I will do that briefly because I really want to get to David. Um, and Jane has mentioned, you know, some of the challenges with, with KiwiSaver. Um, KiwiSaver was a great um, starting point, um, employment-based, getting everyone sort of on the bus, et cetera, but but, but gender bias doesn't really sort of serve women um, taking time out of the workforce. We need to sort some of this out. I think that, you know, as an industry, we need to get proactive. We need to agitate for the changes. James said um, the, the review that sits with MB, what are we sort of doing about it? Letting it run its course with MB so that when they finally consult with us, they've already sort of formed their ideas? Or are we actually going to get active and, and um, take something to them? And that's certainly one of the intentions that we have uh, through this conversation to come out with an industry white paper, um, and we'll talk more about that. I think that um, you know the important of, importance of diversity of thought, women involved in, in product creation and management is really important. Um, so we get these things sort of picked up. Um, women and Super has done a bit of research that we'll release next week just with regard to the amount of women um, and KiwiSaver roles in the industry. You can imagine what those um, results are going to be before I even sort of start talking about them, but keep an eye out because it'll be another conversation. You know, we really need to get the right perspectives um, involved right from the start. I think in relation to the KiwiSaver conversation and, and just where women are left, for providers, I think that there's a, a question around, well, what sort of what, what sort of outcome do we have for women at the moment, you know, in KiwiSaver, where, you know, they're, they're not necessarily getting the um, uh, continued employer contributions because they're, you know, sort of out raising family, et cetera. They're not picking up that free government sort of contribution, et cetera. Is that a good customer outcome under the Kofi, you know, sort of um, regime that's, that's sort of introduced? Um, are we actually considering that? I mean, sure, it's all playing by the rules, but does that mean then to give a good customer outcome, providers should actually be stepping up and actually doing something a bit more with their comms, actually talking to women proactively at the start of a year in respect of making sure that they get that total, you know, 1,021 contribution to pick up that free money rather than just the, let's face it, dare I say it, tick the box, send out the annual reminder, you know, quickly get your money in there. You know, it's having the time to plan, talk to the husband to try and make sure that those contributions continue. I think it's all about sort of proactivity. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that with my own sort of advisory sort of hat on, I was working on um, with a group of people prior to sort of uh, COVID was a KiwiSaver Awards program. There's one run in Australia, Super Awards, and that was um, a sort of a, a retail focused, you know, I think, five buyers, et cetera, program whereby um, the, you know, someone goes into a um, supermarket, they're making their purchase, a percentage of that spend goes directly to your KiwiSaver account. I mean, women are making 80% of the household spend decisions. Why couldn't we look at something like that in New Zealand? Why can't we lead in New Zealand? I mean, Australia ran a financially fit um, campaign um, for females several years ago, you know, that sponsored by Commonwealth Wealth Bank, sponsored by Colmar Brunton, aimed to have one point, sorry, one million actions taken by women over that 12 months, which was sort of the, the nemesis of, and the idea around sort of creating this campaign. Why can't we start playing bold um, and do some of these things? And I think that there's a, there's a great conversation around product um, and just thinking outside the box what we can can do differently. So we know we know the challenges that are there for KiwiSaver. Um, let's just sort of pick them up and do something with them. But on that note, David, as our male panellist, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> as a fund manager, you know, what solutions do you think miss, are missing um, and how can those in the gig economy and the self-employed get in on the action? Crikey, that's not the question you gave me before. Oh, well, surprise, surprise. <laughs> and then we'll move on to how we get men involved in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, kia ora, everyone, for a start. Welcome. It's great to see so many familiar faces, but also some new ones, and, and a few token men thrown into the audience. So I really appreciate that. Um, can, can I go back to that question at the end, maybe? You can. You can do whatever you like, David. That's, oh, that's good. Um, 
When Philippa asked me to join this panel, um, the first thing, I had a bit of a flashback to my childhood. Does everyone uh, remember Sesame Street by chance? Yeah. Hands up. <laughs> Crikey, there's a few older people than I thought here. Um, there's one game or song, and I can't sing, so I'm not going to sing it in, uh, in tune, but uh, there was a game there It says, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things doesn't belong. Can you tell me which one of these others are like? And um, I was thinking about me uh, sitting, <laughs> sitting up here. Um, and all, actually, all jokes aside, uh, it's a topic I suspect that actually a lot of men find quite hard to join in this conversation. Um, I have, and I've, I've written, uh, recently written a piece and stuff around the gender retirement gap. And it took me quite a while to to make sure that I wasn't going to be offending anyone or to think about how it might be read coming from a male's perspective or a, um, a, someone who knows and has got a, an incredible passion for this topic. Um, but I, I, I think today, actually, I hope that me speaking here will, will open that gate a little bit further for other men to, to contribute and participate because this is uh, an incredibly important issue and one that we all can, uh, you know, benefit from as well. So I hope that will remove a little bit of that fear. If we lived in a world that women had pay equity uh, way back in the day and didn't have to take time out for family, both with their own family and extended family, I suspect that this panel discussion could be quite a lot different and focused on maybe some of the things that we are touching on today to really tighten up and improve the gap uh, along the way. However, you know, we don't live in this fantasy land. So what are the things that we can look to help to improve the gap while those two big areas continue to get addressed? And there are challenges that we all need to kind of bring to life. I've always thought about, well, what's the ambulance that we can put on top of the cliff when solving, uh, solving a problem like this. So what's the things that we can do, be doing for the next generation so they don't find themselves in this situation? And, you know, I think, and I look back sometimes to go forward from a historical perspective, and I wonder, I'm just going to, I took a photo of something, and I wonder, Mary Potter, I'll see you in the back there. Do you, have you seen, do you remember those? You don't, you don't have to read it. You just, look at the, <laughs> just look at the picture. <laughs> no, the savings thing. That's right. So, uh, and Jane, you would have been part of that, maybe, oh, in the well, old day. I Remember know. that? So did I. So school banking in, in my day was um, uh, kind of my first introduction to investment or savings. Um, every Monday, i get 20 cents from mum to pop into my savings account, and over a period of time, I started seeing something, this wonderful thing called interest, and I guess that's what compounded my interest. Forgive the pun, it's pretty bad. <laughs> Sorry, that's a dad joke. <laughs> a dad joke. Just saying, yeah, no more of those, I'm not working very well. Um, but it was something that I saw with my fellow students, that habit of savings is just incredible. And, you know, it hasn't been in schools for decades, and for all the right or wrong reasons, it's not there. Um, but I guess if we're looking, looking ahead, uh, well, when we're talking about this topic, the first thing I hear when I'm speaking publicly or when uh, I'm in the industry, everyone says, well, financial capability or literacy, whatever you like to say, has to be in schools. Well, guess what? It actually already is. I know that the Commission has done a lot of work in this area. I was in the Commission when we got the funding to, to get sorted and schools started. And I just checked in with Tista and she said around 70% of secondary schools today are actually bringing it into the curriculum for year 11, 12 and 13 year olds. I'm oh, sorry. Year term is 11, 12, 13. So, Nine yeah. To 11, probably. Yeah, oh, it's more, uh, yeah, sorry, in that fifth, sixth, and seventh form of showing my age. <laughs> Which we need to kind of bring out and talk about in the industry a lot more because I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm sure Jane's absolutely over it in respect that, we, that that has to be in schools. It's there, bring it to life, get it out to all the schools. And, and make sure that the messaging is, is there for all um, students, leveraging into, if you like, our, our current employer 
school banking program, which is called KiwiSaver. You know, one of the key messages that I'd love to see in the school and in the curriculum and in, in financial capability for students and for female students, it needs to be loud and clear that the material that, that, that we do develop is building on their own individual financial independence. I can't stress that enough. Today's life stages are a far cry back from the days of my mother and father. You know, uh, irrespective of relationships, it's important to ensure that each, each, one, each, each person takes control and manages their own financial well-being and capability. Relationships come and go, and I think we need to be prepared for that and having that conversation and having that, I guess, ownership is something that, we, that I really love to see um, go further. I still believe for most Kiwis, KiwiSaver, I can't help it because I lo I've been around it so much. I just love it as a, as a I guess, that second pillar of, of savings and, and being ready for retirement um, and to help with your financial well-being when you choose to stop work. The move finally, and I stress this, and I'm sure MB will hate me for saying it, but it took years for our industry and the government to actually have the default fund to be a balanced fund. We wanted that right from the beginning. I, there are people in this audience that we, we laboured that point a lot. And it's just, I think, has contributed to women in particular if they may have not made an active decision, be nearly 15 years of those sitting in conservative funds. And they've missed out on probably the top 10 years of growth that you could imagine. So that is one of the reasons why there is some discrepancy, notwithstanding contribution rates and, and asset allocations uh, into the fund. You know, there has been some great research done, and research is great, but you've got to do something with it. And I think as, as we get more and better information, I totally agree, agree with Jane, we need more information from the regulator and MB and Inland Revenue, who is the source, you know, the source of truth, if you like, when it comes to KiwiSaver, around what's happening in different demographics, and particularly women. The, the example, and, and again was mentioned just recently, the New Zealand Society of Actuaries Kind of, you know, this kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Amongst other things, highlighted the fact that for those KiwiSaver members between 45 and 64, the fund choice is driven by account balance rather than gender. Doesn't that make sense? When you don't have a lot, if there's scarcity, you want to protect it, and most likely you look for more of a conservative option to do that. Notwithstanding the fact that those individuals have probably still got at least another 20 or even 30 years before they reach retirement. So we do need, um, we, we do need to get that message out that actually getting access to growth for a prolonged period of time, even though we've gone through what is probably one of the most challenging years when it comes to markets. And just on that, this year KiwiSaver members for the first time have, ex have experienced prolonged periods of negative returns. And I'm not talking about little drops. We're talking 15, 20% drops. If you think about the credit crisis back in 2008, that was something similar that happened, but it didn't matter to KiwiSaver members because they didn't have a balance or very small balance. They were actually achieving some wonderful outcomes by investing in a market that was a truckload cheaper. And we've got to get that message back out there because my fear is, and I've seen it happen, not as much as I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that, to see that it hasn't as much, but those realising those losses or, or moving to cash or, or moving to a fund that will take a, a lot longer time, given when they're going to be using that money or needing that money, to keep that on those funds aligned and, and to keep with their goals and objectives. So my key message to all KiwiSaver members is, you know, and, and providers is tailoring those messages, messages specifically to women. I mean, if all providers, and Jane said this, and we've, we've done this before around KiwiSaver annual statements, where we got alignment with providers, the regulator, the, um, you know, financial um, commission, um, to, to, to be aligned in getting those key messages across is going to be incredibly important. And this is a really good, good opportunity to do that around market and reaction. So 
KiwiSaver members will get their statement. They've probably only seen three months' worth of negative impact. Wait till their next 12 month statement comes because I suspect we're still in for quite a lot of volatility over the next 12 months as well. A big nod has to go out to the FSC, Women in, in Super, and the Commission for bringing this topic to life. And it is coming to life. And I think it's something that it can't be just a once a quarter or once a month. We need to be bringing this conversation out and certainly talking about it in so many ways across our channels of influence is going to be something really important. And I challenge, you know, providers like ourselves, we have women as part of our brand profile around communications and focusing on that. And we want to continue evolving that uh, information. And I think, um, you know, it's going to be paramount that we all take that lead. The last area I'd like to concentrate or touch on just a little bit, because I think it's, again, incredibly important, um, is the access to accessible and affordable financial advice. I've been banging this drum for a long, long time, and as you can see, I've been around for a long, long time. The access of getting advice through advisors uh, is becoming harder and harder. We've gone through a truckload of regulation, and I'm not to say that we didn't need it, but the time now comes to actually see more women financial advisors coming to the fore. I want to see more role models from women perspective. And we're starting to see that. There's many of them in this room today. We just need to support and bring those thoughts and voices to life. You know, there was a headline this morning, I don't know if you saw it and stuff, which, is, which was pretty depressing, I thought. Um, yeah, and there's, yeah, actually, actually, most of the media is pretty depressing at the moment. Um, woman complains about making $245,000 loss on her fund investment. Have a read of the article. Um, the provider actually offered, and, and, and more than once, to offer some financial advice. But the individual took it on themselves that they wanted a high risk, but didn't really understand, I think, what high risk means until it becomes a reality. And this is, <laughs> this is the year where the rubber hits the road, actually. And I think that, you know, if that person and others sought a little bit of advice, and if there is an investment involved sometimes, um, that, that advice and investment pays huge amounts of dividends going forward. So they are the three areas that I think, you know, alongside the two key areas that we've got to continue to push along uh, to, that will help. I guess improve not only women's retirement outcomes, but the countries as well. And um, I hope we can continue and see this discussion grow legs. And I'm really happy to continue help flying that flag as much as I can from my perspective. So thank you so much for listening to me today. Thank you, David. We certainly appreciate your ongoing support. You're always there um, to be called on, and um, I think that really does show great leadership. Look, I'm conscious of the time. We could be talking about this all afternoon, um, and we did promise a bit of Q&A, so I'm going to shorten that a little bit um, on the basis that we are going to be continuing this conversation. But just a very quick one-line answer um, from the panellists. If there's one thing you would like people in the audience to take away in action from today's conversation, what is it, Jane? Um, hmm. Magically, it's not working anymore. I'm just going to shout. Um, I'd like to see a small industry working group deciding what the three key messages are we need to uh, uh, advocate for for changes to the Kiwi Saver rules. Perfect. David? I really like that one. <laughs> no, I, I genuinely do. Perfect. We'll, yep. we'll leave it at that. Yep. <laughs> Michelle? Um, I think I'd like you just to go out and over the next two weeks choose three people to have a conversation with money about a conversation about money with rather just try it on for size just start oh, it's it it's okay mm. it's okay Perfect, thank you. Look, um, we've got some roving mics. Do we have a couple of quick questions um, that anyone mm. would like to raise? Yes, please have a somewhere. Come yep. in. My caution. Here it comes. Testing. <laughs> Um, hi, my name's Jade. I'm from um, Britannia. 
Uh, one question I do have, which I feel is kind of a gray area, and I'm using myself as an example here. When I was younger and I first started working and contributing to KiwiSaver, education plays a big role in it. Um, but I wasn't very educated myself. I went on a savings suspension holiday for about three years, not because I needed to. I just didn't know, you know, but KiwiSaver uh, in depth back then. I mean, if you actually go onto the IRD website, it says here, you do not need to give a reason for wanting a savings suspension. So I wonder how many other women and people are in that position and they don't actually understand the extent of what they're doing. And should there be those questions, whether it's from KiwiSaver or IRD or your provider? Why are you taking a savings holiday and do you need to? Or should advice be given before they can take it? Exactly, yeah. 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 You you might recall, and and, no, it's a good question, I'd say truckloads. Um, And it it was originally called uh, a savings uh, contribution holiday, remember that? That was one thing we actually did change in the Retirement Income Policy Review back in 2016 to get rid of that because it sounded like it's a good thing. Holidays normally are, aren't they? Um, So suspension, absolutely. The consequences of that gap and the compound impact of that, if they saw a projection of what that three years of not contributing, not getting your employer, not getting the government contribution, how that materially impacts your outcome as a total balance, that would wake people up pretty quickly. And maybe that's something as a topic or an interest that we could bring to life a little bit more. Or even just like, information I guess like on the IRD website as to the benefits of you know because if, if, if I could go back I would keep my contributions up that's three years I've missed I wouldn't have sold know. my defined benefit scheme if that was an old one you know I would not have yeah. <laughs> young people in decision making bad combination yeah. <laughs> you know so just yeah food for thought I guess well yeah I mean and it could be a topic that gets brought into schools when when you leave school and you're in KiwiSaver or you join KiwiSaver if you've got those those principles in place from power of compound interest rate of return asset allocation you know all that all those elements and you know employers have got to pick up the the area as well I mean I think a lot of employers aren't making contributions on behalf of their staff because of the contractual relationships they've got. We've got 1.1 million, don't get, see, I'm getting me started on this. (laughs) 1.1 million New Zealanders that are getting less than the, 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 you know, the $521 tax credit, which means they're saving less than $20 a week. We need to fix that and understand that more. And and we need some sunlight on that sooner rather than later. And I, 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 I suspect it's impacting women probably more than men as well, mm. would be my gut. Perfect. Final final question. Sorry to cut it short, but do you have anything else? Anyone else? No? OK. Well, look, I'm going to hand over to invite Prue Tyler, um, also on the, man- the Women's Super Management Committee, um, with me, just to really basically give us the call to arms, because this is, this is all about action from here on. Um, thank you so much to our panellists, Jane, Michelle, David and to Tracy for wearing two hats at the last minute today um, for facilitating what has been a lively, robust and really quite challenging discussion focusing on the exciting solutions. Um, And that's really what today's all about. Um, Actions and some future-focused solutions. Um, When Philippa and I began planning this event a few months ago, we were really clear what we didn't want to do. And that was to be navel-gazing and whinging about the problem. Um, We all know that problem statement pretty well. Philippa and I, on behalf of Women in Super, wanted today to be the start of a conversation that will test and challenge um, solutions with a view to taking forward some initiatives that will make change towards reducing this retirement gap in New Zealand for women. So it is a call to action, it's the beginning of a journey, and the ideas um, proposed today are a really exciting start, and Women and Super are really committed to taking them forward and leveraging off the momentum that has been shown today to make change, and I, I love the idea of a, um, a, an industry working group, for example, that Jane's proposed with three key messages, um, and I really you know, sort of endorse Jane's idea of the change is going to be targeted measurable and incremental. It's not going to be an overnight one. Um, So thank you, Jane, Michelle, David and Tracy, for your honesty, your passion and courage in sharing the thoughts and ideas um, today. And, you know, today is really about the magic of collaboration. It's really tangible, I think, today. Um, And the sold-out room suggests the industry alignment on um, 
the absolutely critical need to change the game for women in New Zealand. We know the ultimate end game is that we don't need this um, FSC's three-month campaign that starts with action, that the retirement gap is no longer, and financial literacy is a given. Um, I also want to acknowledge the great research work that has been done by so many that we've drawn on in um, preparing for today. Um, it's really important that we get your input and that of your organisation as an industry participant. We'll send out a feedback form where you can submit your thoughts on the solutions discussed today or different ideas, um, which you think have merit and will be of most impact, and further details will be provided on the process. Um, the FSC and Women in Super really do want to hear from you. Um, we're planning to continue this conversation at the summit um, on the 28th of July um, in pursuing this campaign objective of improving the financial well-being of women. Um, and, you know, really sort of endorsing that we want, this is a responsibility for everyone, it's, it's about actually allocating the roles to actually making the change. So we really look forward to your support on that. Um, a huge thanks to Westpac for hosting today, um, the FSC and for you and all of your time. Um, kia tau, kia tato katoa, te ao, te aroha, me te maruto, te he Māori ora. May peace, love and safety be upon us all, a promise of a glorious day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think there's been um, a great conversation, great solutions. It's a start. Um, action is going to follow. This train has left the station, so I'd really encourage you to get back into your organisations, tell them they need to get on this train with us because it's going, we are making change with you or with not. So, so thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we love to share the journey with you. Thank you. Thank you.